when you start to get that first sale for someone or when they hit that first hundred sales a month and when they start to hit these big milestones that they wanted but they never knew that they could hit it's like you're really doing the most important work that this brand needs Welcome back for another episode of Copy This, Not That, where we invite an expert, a digital marketing expert, to join us to talk to us about the role of freelance copywriting in their industry and how we can step it up and offer value in that industry so that we can land more clients, make more money, and build businesses that we love. Today's yeah. guest is Kirsten Ross. Hi! Hey, thanks so much for having me. Yes, thank you so much for joining me. So Kirsten is a launch strategist. Tell us a little bit about your business and what you do. Yeah. Um, so, hey, for those watching, uh, I'm Kirsten. I'm the CEO of Launch and Scale. Uh, what we do is we work with e-commerce brands to launch new products and scale them up. Um, we focus on early stage, meaning we want to take people from that pre-launch or that zero dollars in revenue right up until their first two or three million um, and beyond. So um, how we do that, we I have a marketing agency where we don't do a lot of um, say copywriting slash advertising, et cetera, for our clients, as well as run a online accelerator for more of a DIY approach to e-commerce. Awesome. I love that because oftentimes you hear a lot of people saying, I don't want to work with the startups. I don't want to work with the people who haven't it. made sales. I don't want to work with people who don't have a proven offer. What is it about that new launch that gets you excited? I love to make my life hard. I'm kidding. That's <laughs> okay. There's something about like, it's funny because a lot of people get burnt out of startups or they want to serve more established companies. Um, I've been working with startups most of my professional career and I just love the, how fast paced it is. I love how quick you need to make decisions. And in that first three years of business, you're really trying to do something that no one's really proven to be able to do before because every product is completely different and in the first couple of years what you're doing is you're literally throwing a bunch of stuff against the wall and to see what's going to stick so i think that while it is the hardest because you have a lot of startups that don't have a lot of money um they don't have a proven offer and you the grit that you need to endure that just as like an entrepreneur like i think that those hardships and helping someone go through that is probably one of the most rewarding experiences you could have because when you start to get that first sale for someone or when they hit that first hundred sales a month and when they start to hit these big milestones that they wanted but they never knew that they could hit it's like you're really doing the most important work that this brand needs because without those grueling first two or three years they're not going to hit that seven, eight figure level. And so I think that it's the most rewarding at this stage of the business, even though it's the most challenging. Yeah, so. I love that. And honestly, I mean, they need it so much. They are an expert in their product. They're an expert in the development of it and they know their product in and out, but that doesn't necessarily make them great at getting it out there to the right people. And so it's so necessary to have somebody like you behind the scenes who can help guide them. And I'm yeah. sure you've developed some frameworks and, you know, systems for where to start and what to test and how to get things rolling. What are some of the most effective ways you've seen? Uh, like what's, what's one of the first things that you have a new client do? One of the first things we have a new client do, I think is, we set expectations sure um, because a lot of clients will come to us that have a great idea like they're the engineers of this world they have an idea and they have money for example and sometimes they're like because you're the professional you're going to figure this out for me and i think that in the very beginning we have to set expectations of like no one's done this before and everything you think you know about who your customer is or what kind of marketing is going to work or what kind of message is just a hypothesis and we are going to be wrong 95% of the time. So we have to take a testing approach to everything. So step number one is really um, 
setting expectations and then making sure we're leading with the right hypothesis, if that makes sense. And then yeah, it really does. we just look to work with them. And because everything people think they know about going into business is wrong. People are very emotionally attached to their product. They're very emotionally attached to the outcome of the results. And so in the first three months, when you tell them we're not going to get sales or we're going to start getting some sales, but that's data, they don't really get that until they go through that three month period. And they're like, it's been a day. Why don't I have sales yet? It's because this is the process. And then over time, you're going to start to see it go from like this to starting to see some of those results. So I think like allowing them to stomach that process uh -huh. and start to really learn the testing and the, uh, moving the emotionality away from the process so that they can kind of go through that and see success on the other side. So, yeah, totally. And I feel like I, I really am super glad you mentioned setting the expectations because I also believe that no matter who your client is, setting the expectations for what it's going to be like to work with you, what they can expect. It's like the biggest favor you can do for yourself. Otherwise the client will create their own expectations. And if you don't know what those are, or they don't line up with yours, it's challenge. I'll say challenges instead of problems, but it's roadblocks. It's bumps in the road that yeah. are, you know, on the horizon for sure. Yeah. And while some people would rather go with a marketing agency, it's like, we can get you a thousand sales in a week. What happens if that agency doesn't deliver? That's a really great way to increase your turnover rate because they're like, it's been six weeks. You've got us nothing like you over promised and completely under delivered. So for us, we, I would rather go the opposite of like, here's realist, but then we celebrate every little milestone and then they can just start to see things like build up from there. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah. So what role does copy play in your, what you do for your e -com clients? Everything. Like <laughs> we, while we are like, you know, our question, right? <laughs> no, like we are a full service digital agency from video to copy to whatever, but like, we have things like email marketing is still huge, which is persuasive copy, which nothing can replace, like to really, nothing can really replace that. So we have email marketing, which is massive. We have sales copy on landing pages. We have product descriptions. We have headlines on the website. We have um, the scripts that we run for video. We have the descriptions we use for video. It's everywhere because copy isn't just writing it is communicating a value of a product so copy is sales and it is integrated in like every part of what we do in the business right and it all starts with words if you can't describe it in words you're not going to be able to get that message out there through a video or through images or you know yeah it all starts with words because words is communicating it's not mm -hmm. just using um like when you have something like a jasper or something like ai that's like the novices are the ones that are like oh you know it's these ai softwares are going to help us communicate better like mm -hmm. no they're not because the edge that we have as humans versus robots mm -hmm. is we're able to take it a step further with persuasion and i think that um people that are able to still communicate human to human are going to beat everything no matter what you do in the future because it's not about being able to pump out volume of copy it's like the effectiveness of copy because ultimately it's about persuasion and human communication yeah totally i mean you can words 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 all day long but if it's not targeted to the right people with the right message at the right time it's yeah. empty and it becomes just part of the background that people don't even notice anymore yeah but yeah, copy is like, it's in everything we do. And it's not just about writing, it's taking things. Like the more we educate ourselves in marketing and human psychology, the layers go so deep. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, I think there are a lot more moving pieces than people think. So when you go to your clients and you, um, and maybe if this is something you communicate internally with your team or with the client as well, but when you tell them like, these are all the things that we're creating. Are they like, Oh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's more than just one email. It's more than just one 
uh, social media posts, it's more, are they kind of surprised by the sheer volume? Yeah, because you don't know how many moving parts are in a business until you start to do it. And it's like one basic thing if we're hired to do a social media post, it's like, okay, cool. So that's 30 posts in a month. It's like, first, what's the strategy? What are the topics? What are the posts? What's the copy? What are the hashtags? And then how do we promote those posts? And then it's just like layers and layers. They're like, oh, I just hired mm -hmm. you to do posts. I'm like, no, it's not. A, there's like so much. So, yeah. so much. Yes. Um, one thing that I think um, clients often don't realize as well is like when email, you had mentioned the importance of email. And I think email is always going to be important um, that there are different types of sequences at different points in the campaigns. And so it's funny when I start working with clients who have not yet quite dove into this yet, they're like, oh, yeah, nope, I don't have that. Nope, I don't have anything for abandoned cart either. Nope. I don't, I don't have anything for <laughs> webinar reminder. Oh shoot. Like there's all these touch points that you're leaving on the table if they're not being addressed. God. I know. And that's like, you want to see an overwhelmed look on a client's face when you're like email marketing. So do you have the thing, like everything you just said, do you have the things? And then like, what's your ongoing strategy? And then what about the things you're like, can you just do it for me? <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Do you email your list is usually the question I ask first. Like, how often do you email your list? And they're like, oh, it's been a while. Right. So we start there. We start with, you know, yeah, warming up your list. And so when you go looking for writers inside your agency, what types of skills or qualities are you looking for when you bring writers onto your team? Love this. So depending on, so we do for well, internal is like um our business right so right. marketing our agency and then there's the client agent client business side so we outsource for clients um what i look for in a writer is i want to see portfolio i um, want to see that they specialize in a certain area like if it's a fitness client um and you have to go into like the science and just more things like i don't want to hire a food blogger to do that because they're not kind of in that niche. So I look for um, that they specialize in a certain kind of product, certain area. I look for past experience. I look for a portfolio um, because it's not, again, like everyone has a different writing style and I want to make sure that it's when I read through their content that I can see that being on brand mm -hmm. with whatever the, the client is that we're outsourcing for. Totally. Um, those are the main things in terms of like making sure it's relevant experience. And then um, typically I look to place someone ongoing for that account. So mm -hmm. at that point, I don't just say, great, you're hired. Give us a whole bunch of copy and emails. I will then if I narrow, like if I'm hiring on like Upwork or something, uh -huh. um, I will narrow it down to three copywriters mm -hmm. and I'll say, hey, can you guys all make me a um, like a one paragraph email. So I do like a one or two hour trial for all of them and then test them to see how they deliver, um, how like um, on point was it to what I asked them to do and what is the style for that? So uh -huh. once they do that, like that paid trial, then I pick the one that I want to do on an ongoing basis and we just kind of go from there. Right. Yeah. So. Awesome. What types of things are you looking for inside the portfolio? What types of work? So if I'm hiring someone for email marketing, I want to see email marketing. I don't necessarily want to see product descriptions or blogs because again, that's not the style I'm looking for. Right. So awesome. sounds yeah. good. Is yeah. there anything in other outside content besides work samples that you'd like to see in a portfolio that tells you right away, okay, this person knows what they're doing. Yeah. So let's say I'm hiring for email marketing. Um, I know from an e-com side that emails have to do two things. They have to nurture and they have to sell. So let's hypothetically say I have a copywriter that, um, has done a bunch of newsletters, but they haven't done a lot of sales copy. Sure. If I know that I need emails that can sell, mm -hmm. um, I'm looking for their ability to sell me through written sure. word. Yeah, totally. So can they sell themselves as a copywriter in their portfolio? Yeah. 
because I think when I look at how we hire, like it's, I have to look different layers deep where it's like, okay, well, what are we hiring for? We're hiring for emails. What's the result we need these emails to have for this mm -hmm. client. And then based on that, hire someone who I think can not just write emails, but like deliver on the result that we want, whether that is to nurture for an up and coming product launch or whether that's to sell for an ongoing e-commerce client. So, yeah, exactly. Exactly. What yeah. are some red flags that you see that, help you steer clear from maybe a uh, not a good fit? Uh, yeah. So if I narrow it down to like a paid trial and they don't read the instructions, well, number one, sure. number two, they don't deliver on time. Mm -hmm. Um, number three, they don't seem flexible to work with. Sure. Those are red flags. Yeah, totally. So catch that everybody. If they don't read the instructions, read the instructions, deliver on time and be willing to work within the agency's parameters because it's their client and they want to serve their client to the best of their ability. I love that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So when you're putting together everything, do you have standard packages that you pitch to your clients or do you build it personally, like customized according to that particular business? So right now we have custom packages. I would like to customize, but we, I wouldn't say we, like if they're hiring a specialty email marketing agency, I can mm -hmm. see them doing custom packages because you guys will just go seven layers deep with all the things that they need. Um, but what we do, because we're early stage, there isn't a lot of complexity so far sure. that our clients need. So we end up having two kinds of packages, one mm -hmm. being four newsletters a month, uh, mm -hmm. are volume based. So we'll say like this many emails a month versus flow based. So if they want the, the flows or the, the sequences written, that's going to be like standard flat rate, but awesome. that's as far as we go. We don't do, um, yeah, like, cause it can get so complex. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it really, it really, really can. Do they often come to you with an idea of strategy or mm -hmm. not so much? I want them to. Good, good. Okay. Um, yeah, I want them to. Like, I think in the beginning, the client may be like, I have no idea what I want you to write to my list. But once we start to spitball ideas and say like, hey, okay, cool. Here's kind of what we, where we think we should start. And we start to get into the flow of one email a week or whatever. They will start to come up with ideas when they start to get comments or replies mm -hmm. or whatever. So if they don't come to us in the beginning with ideas, we're fine just to be like, all right, well, what do you think of these? And over time, they're going to get comfortable and bring in their own. So, yeah. And uh, honestly, that really needs to happen because it tells you that they're dialing in on their audience. They're, yes. they're thinking about, they're getting engaged with, they're serving and focusing outside of their offer on the people, which really without an audience, there's no offer really. Yeah. So if you i had a great question and now it's gone shoot hang on i'm gonna get it back ugh so we did red flags well let me ask you this instead if you could go back to when you first started your business mm -hmm. what would you do differently oh my god <laughs> like where do i start <laughs> honestly I would push more direct selling. Okay. That's what I for would your, do. For your own agency or for your clients? For yeah. our own agency. Um, the way that we've grown our business has been 100% organic with referrals and YouTube and podcasts and stuff. And mm -hmm. I think that I've spent the last like six years trying to figure out my model that I haven't pushed the model as fast, as hard as I wanted to go. So I would go harder and I would go faster to get more data faster. To yeah. Be able to, yeah. And just to get more clients to just push, even though you may not have it all figured out, because guess what? I've learned after seven years, you're never going to have it all figured out. You just have to keep <laughs> yeah. pushing. So yeah. I have to say, I, I agree with that. That's something that I wish I had started my email list sooner. I wish I had started creating lead magnets sooner. I wish I had started testing things in front of my audience sooner because I would have that information more now to be able to be 
going further faster today. Oh and at the time I didn't know what I didn't know. And I thought it has to be perfect or I have to figure every little piece of it out before I take action. Not true. You don't, <laughs> you can take action and learn from it as you go. Yeah. So that would be from like business owner to business owner. That's probably the thing I would definitely, definitely change. And it, it's hard because even I'm still, I have to catch myself when I'm like, oh, it's time for a new lead magnet. And you sit there for a month, like, right. <laughs> like who cares? Just make one. If it flops, you have data, you move on to the next thing. Right, right, exactly. And I think oftentimes we think, well, I don't have anything to offer my audience or I don't, <laughs> I don't know about you, but sometimes I sit down in front of social media and I'm like, I don't know anything. Like I got nothing to say, not true. Go back further, go more basic than you think. That's what I always tell myself. Like, I always think it has to be something innovative or new or whatever. And then I remember that my audience is not as far along in their understanding as I am in the areas that I can help them with. I need to go back mm -hmm. to the basics and start there and meet them where they are and walk with them. I was giving an illustration inside one of my paid groups today about let's imagine that you're a guide walking through the jungle with a group. You're yeah. the only person in that group who has ever been to the destination. You know where you're going, you know the pitfalls, you know the dangers. If you get separated from your group, they don't know what to do next. And They're so they freeze, right? They freeze. And so you've got two choices, right? You can stay where you are and try to, you know, get their attention and shout at them, get you, get them to come to you, yeah. or you can go to where they are and lead them out. Mm -hmm. And the risks being, I think a lot of times as business owners, we like, Hey, over here, I'm over here. Come on. And they're like, but Right. Where are you? How? How? Or they get bit by a snake on their way. But they can't find the rope bridge across the gorge, you know, or whatever. So oh, I always yeah. remind my clients, like, you have to go where they are because they can't get to where you are. They don't know what they don't know. That is so good. I'm going to steal that metaphor. Yeah, do it. Yeah. Yeah. My <laughs> random jungle <laughs> analogies. But yeah. But yeah, and I'm like sitting there. That's me, classic. Like, hey guys, come to me. It's real easy. Just take a step. And they're like, I don't know where you are. Just take a step. I get it. And I have to remind my, myself, I had all the same misconceptions and fears and doubts and questions mm -hmm. as they did. And the only way I got through it was to do it. And, you know, because, I mean, we both have had such good mentors to yeah. help us navigate those steps for sure. Yeah. I love shout out to Rachel. Right. Rachel, woo, woo. I know a lot of you here are familiar with um, Rachel and she actually just had a freelancer boot camp the last couple of days. Yeah. Maybe some of you were on that, but uh, yep. Girlfriend knows her stuff. And oh one thing I love about her is the level of belief that she has in her yeah. students, which is something I, I love to pass on to mine. Like I will, believe in you before you believe in yourself and until you believe in, well, and beyond, but borrow mine because that can get you somewhere, even if you don't have it in you yet. So if you were getting started today, like I said, what's one thing you did in the beginning that you're really proud of? Yeah. So in the beginning, where I was at in my business is I had no idea what I was doing. I wasn't niched down into e -com or Kickstarter or anything. I went where the money was in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I knew that I am an entrepreneur and I will never work for anyone. I went through too many corporate jobs and I just made that commitment to myself. So in the very beginning, I had no idea what I was going to do. I know that I knew that I was, I loved working with startups. I knew how to sell, but I really had, I had no packages figured out it I was just at the point where I was like I just have to say yes and start to get paid I'll figure yeah. it out so one thing I'm really glad I did was I just started going to a bunch of networking events meeting people talking to people see what they were struggling with and see if there was a way that I could help them and put some price tag behind that sure you were doing a lot of random crap in the beginning mm -hmm. but like step one pay the bills step yeah. two figure out what you like and start to, to go there. So 
that's what I'm really glad I did in the beginning. I didn't wait to figure out what my specialty was until I had certain skills. I was like, what do you need? I'll, I'll help you do it. I have some experience. So yes. Yeah. And I love that. I, I totally agree. I did the exact same thing. I, I just went straight into it and whatever people said they needed, I was like, yep, I can do that. And sometimes I learned it as I went, <laughs> but I hardly ever said no in the beginning because I just wanted to learn. I just wanted to do and see what I liked. And as things progressed, then I, you know, made, Change gave it. myself permission to choose and be yeah. choosy. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, it was intense. Like it was super intense and it was hard for me to let go of thinking that I still had to say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband had to get a little bit like, Hey, no, you, <laughs> you have to stop taking on these projects that you don't love because now you have it enough of what you do love and you know what you love, but don't let not knowing yet stop you from taking action. So it might get a little bit crazy for a little while. That's all data for you as you grow that you can learn. And what is it that they say? There's no fail. There's just learn. There's, there's succeed or learn, or there's win or learn. You either win or you learn. Yeah. I like that. The only way you fail is if you give up. <laughs> yes. Oh, so what's next for your business? What is, what are you looking ahead at over this next quarter that you're excited about? Oh man. So we, mm, what aren't we? We're <laughs> doubling down on certain things. So we're, our last 12 months was like probably the worst we've had in business. And from that, um, there was a point where I thought it was like such a low, I thought it was going to lose my business. And because of that perspective, we're fine now. And we've had a great last few months, but um, of that almost losing the business and going into like a negative mindset spiral and stuff, I realized how much I wanted my business. I realized how much I wanted and loved certain parts of my business and also how much I resented certain parts of the business. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the biggest lesson is I think I've just been playing too small by the sidelines. And sure. now that I know how much I want my business, which seems like it sounds weird because you do something for five years, but like I really, really love my business. We're implementing some big changes to go from okay to world-class with everything. Love so it. for us, like we don't have, there are projects we're doing, of course, but like for me in the next six to 12 months, like we're raising the bar on everything we do in terms of the support we have, the content we put out, um, the client support we have. And so, it, you know, it's really just raising the bar because I want to, give this my all. And I realized coming out of the last 12 months that I was just playing too small by the sidelines before that. So I want to play now as if I'm going to lose my business in 18 months, because I think that's really going to be how we're able to take everything to the next level from revenue, from being a place that people are like, I only want to work with them. And right. so, yeah, that's, it's not that's easy, it. but it, those lessons can change everything. Exactly. And uh, I'm so pumped. And so while well, we're doing a lot of the same things we've been doing for the last two, three years, it's just like we're, it, it, I feel like we're finally taking it seriously as mm -hmm. stupid as it sounds. Um, but yeah, that is, that's what this year is raising the bar. Yeah. I love that. We have so much in common when it comes to like our determination. And sometimes when things are going well enough, you don't take action enough. I know I tend to fall into that. Things are going well enough, but yeah. I know it's not the end. Like, I know there's more. I know there's more potential. If I can keep feeling that urgency and mm -hmm. that the importance of continuing to grow mm -hmm. um, and to stay in momentum and to keep pushing um, in a healthy way for myself and, and my personal life, but also in a way that keeps me on my toes, it really makes a big difference. Huge. And I really thought I was invincible going into last year. I honestly thought like, though people say you need to have six months of savings because you can lose it all overnight. People say these bad things happen, but oh, I'm good. No, no, no. I have a YouTube channel. Like it'll never happen to me. And then it happened. And then I was like, I don't want to oh. make money. I'll just go make more money. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, okay, that happened. So now I've been humbled and now I'm taking this seriously. 
And I'm like, so excited. And I think a lot of, a lot of us in this group right now have been in that place where we're like, okay, I may have been sleeping on opportunities that I need to be taking advantage of, or I may have been playing small with my writing skills and not turning it into something that will be a business for me into the future, no matter what this economy is like right now. And so wake up call, like it's time to stop playing and start really being a player in the industry. Well, how can we learn more about you? When we're done with this video, I would love it if you would drop some social media links, a website link so that we can connect with you more. Um, if there are product sellers, which I know that there are e-com sellers in here and you want to learn more about Kirsten and her agency, that way they'll be able to get in contact with you. Yes, I'd love to do that. And if you guys have any questions or comments, um, just tag me in the post. I need to make sure I'm in the group. I'm in a lot of Facebook groups, so we'll do that first. And then yeah, I'll go send you an invite if you're not in. But thank you so much for joining us today and just giving us all this valuable um, gold and information and motivation. And I just I could talk shop all day long. Yeah, me so too. Thank you so much. <laughs> Have a great weekend. You too. Thanks, guys, for your watching today. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. <laughs>